All right. Well, welcome everybody here. Uh, this is uh, another fine day in Vancouver. Uh, we are here to talk about uh, a fun presentation that we do and, and kind of a fun series in general that we want to talk about, uh, which is Couch to OpenStack. Uh, we're very happy because we've got a, a great room of folks here today and hopefully you get some good enjoyment out of this. We definitely encourage people to ask questions along the way. Uh, the one thing we do hope, of course, is just for the purposes of recording everything, there's a microphone in the middle aisle down there, so uh, no pressure, but you're going to be uh, recorded for the questions. It's good, though, because it'll go up on the video. Uh, otherwise, if you do ask a question, we can repeat the question, but it's ideal if we could go off the middle there. Again, we encourage folks, if you have questions along the way, the good news is we won't get through our slides. The bad news is we won't get through our slides. Either way, everybody wins, I think. Uh, so to get everything started, uh, the idea of Couch to OpenStack is the same idea as a Couch to 5K. It's how do we get started? You know, while we're at the OpenStack Summit and we've got a lot of folks who've you know, probably been deep into the ecosystem for a while, there's always a, a freshman class. There's always folks that need to kind of get rolling and maybe bring a comparative learning from where they were before in, in the ecosystem. So talk about who we are, but so you know, get a sense on uh, who, who's up here today. Uh, my name is Eric Wright. Uh, I'm a blogger I, and a few other things. I'm a technology evangelist for a company called VM Turbo, and I blog at discoposse.com. It's just pretty easy to find that way, and I'm at discoposse on Twitter. And if you had any doubt, our pictures are on the slides too. <laughs> my name is Melissa Palmer. You can find me on Twitter at vmis33, and I also blog at vmis.net. If you want to take pictures along the way, don't be afraid to tag us because we love pictures of ourselves while we're on stage. It's a rare thing because we can't do it while we're here. Okay, so let's go over what we're going to talk about today in a little more detail. First, we're going to talk about OpenStack getting started and some challenges sometimes people face when they're beginning. We're going to talk a little bit about OpenStack distributions. We're going to briefly cover some of the key project topologies, go over something called the OpenStack Cookbook Lab, uh, focus a little bit on Nova and Neutron, which are two of the key components of OpenStack, and we'll go over some online resources to kind of help you after you leave the room. Our goal today is to coach you from zero to hero on OpenStack. Uh, outside of here, uh, there's a lot of other resources. One of the online resources that I shamelessly like to promote is that I've done a course for Pluralsight, if anybody is uh, already uh, familiar with them. Uh, if you're a V-expert or Cisco champion, there's a lot of community groups that actually give out uh, free access to Pluralsight or they have a trial available. And, and I actually did an introduction to OpenStack course there, which is about a two and a half hour you know, walk through uh, a little bit more deeper dive, unfortunately, than we can get into in 40 minutes. Uh, it was for the Havana release. At the same time, of course, it is, it is valid because a lot of it talks about the general projects and the, and the concepts behind it. You know, why we're talking about Couch to OpenStack is because even though we've, we're all smart folks, you know, we maybe work in virtualization, we work in networking, we work in all these areas for a long time, and we think, oh, this is going to be easy. I'm just going to, you know, just like I did when I learned VM or vSphere or learned, learned Citrix. I learned other technologies. I'm like, oh, I'll just go and read a blog and figure out how to do it. So you go online and you want to learn about OpenStack. Well, OpenStack is it's a lot of things. It's even hard to describe what it is sometimes. So you quite often you'll see your, your journey that you get brought on by a quick little article on how to learn OpenStack looks something like this. It's a very simple two-step process. Draw some circles. Step two, draw the rest of the owl. Now, we, we know that we... We've been through this, you know, I've, I've learned, I wanted to get into deep doc, Docker networking. So I found an article and it skipped about 85 middle steps and, you know, got right to, hey, it works. And, and I never got there. You know, it took a while to practice. OpenStack was the same thing for me. I went through the install guys repeatedly, kept finding errors. It was a real challenge. I mean, we're not alone in this journey. I like to think, uh, think I'm a smart person, but at the same time, you can only be as good as the, the documentation and the guides that bring you through the process. This is a common experience that you're going to find on Twitter, and it's a, it's a fun interaction you get to have. Just imagine as you're you know, a, a teacher or, or an OpenStack advocate, when you see someone says, perhaps it's the most hideous installation ex procedures known to man. Thanks, OpenStack. I've made it. You finally get to the point where you see the Horizon dashboard login screen. It's like crossing the finish line at a marathon. It doesn't necessarily need to be that way, and that's why there's a lot of different ways we can deal with this. So let's talk a little bit about how to make this a little easier for you. There's something called an OpenStack distribution. And if you've been around the marketplace today, you've seen many, many options for this. Some of these you'll see that are already in your data center, vendors you're familiar with. 
and some other vendors specialize just in OpenStack. What all they have in common is they're much easier to deploy, much easier to upgrade, and they also kind of add some secret sauce that vanilla OpenStack, when you install it yourself, doesn't ha quite have. So distributions are a great place to get started. So common free platforms, let's say your budget is zero, like mine when I started with OpenStack. What's your favorite flavor of free, free Linux, Ubuntu or CentOS? So each of them have their own free distribution, Canonical or RDO, and if you look at some blogs, yes, they're a little difficult sometimes, but there's a lot of really good walkthroughs on how to get started with either of these flavors of OpenStack distributions. So how many of you people use VMware? All right, lots of hands. How many of you people have Enterprise Plus licensing? Lots more hands. So the cool thing is that you have something called the VMware Integrated OpenStack, which is a new product from VMware, and it's their OpenStack distribution. One of the great things about this is A, it's free to get started with, and B, for your operations team and administrators, you're gonna use a lot of the common vCenter and virtualization components that you're used to. So yes, you'll have the Horizon dashboard, but you'll also be doing these things in vCenter and vRealize. The great thing about this, besides it being free, is you can eventually move it into production. However, when you do go to production, there will be support costs, which are usually a good thing. You would want support in production. Remember that, guys. Uh, so, of course, the one thing that happens as well, depending on how new you are to OpenStack, is you may see a lot of names on here, and the different projects or programs, and it's a lot of confusion around what it is. So, as we walk through this, some of you folks may be ahead of this, and some of you may be just getting rolling. So, we want to do a quick walkthrough of what the different projects are within. And again, the word project is challenging, because they were called projects, and then they were renamed to programs, because tenants within an OpenStack cloud are called projects. And then they decide, okay, good, we'll call it programs. And then all of a sudden, about six months ago, they started calling them projects again. So you'll see that interchanged when we talk about the different things inside OpenStack. The kind of core of what OpenStack is is this neat little eye chart right here. You've probably seen it in, in most of the presentations you've been in. Unfortunately, it, it is a bit of an eye chart. It's best when printed on a large poster. In fact, it looks really great. I wish I had this TV in my living room. But it's a good depiction of the way that the projects interact and what each of them are, as well as different subcomponents. Now, of course, we aren't going to start here because it's kind of a, a gnarly way to get rolling. So we're going to just quickly walk through what each of them are. Yeah, so let's go through the project step by step and talk a little bit about them. Keystone, the identity service, and I love how some of the names have great little puns in them. Basically, Keystone boils down to authentication and authorization. So who are you and what can you do inside of OpenStack? Now, Keystone is really important to deploy in a highly available manner because if you don't have Keystone, you're not doing anything else in OpenStack. One of the great features that came out in key, the, key, uh, the Kilo release this week were the Keystone to Keystone Federation, which simply means that I have different OpenStack clouds and now they can actually talk to each other. It's an important initiative, especially as folks get started and they want to get into OpenStack, but maybe you've already engaged another cloud platform or you've already got another OpenStack cloud, so that's going to be an important step. Then we have the Glance service. Now, Glance is our image service, uh, not images as in like sh sh pictures, but images as in templates and virtual machines and virtual instances. Uh, this is another one, the, the nomenclature can be an adventure sometimes. Now, you've probably got a few different operating systems that you run in your own platform. So you've got Ubuntu, maybe you've got some Windows boxes, and maybe you've got CentOS. Uh, maybe you've got some other thing of choice, you know, whatever your operating system is that you want. The important thing about Glance is that there's a lot of cool ways you can deal with that. You know, Glance itself is how we, we store and manage our services. It's the actual registry of all those services. Uh, it can be shared as a global image, so you can upload an image and share it among all your tenants, or if you only have one, that's nice and easy. Uh, the good thing is that you can also do per tenant, so let's say you have a development group, and you want your development group to have all sorts of fancy images over there, you give them fancy images, and you don't share them with the, the marketing team or a human resources, maybe they don't need that. Uh, the good thing as well is when you've got development teams, you want to enable them. That's the whole goal of OpenStack in a big way is to empower your consumer to be able to do more with it. So they can actually upload their own custom images, which is a handy thing. You store these in different projects, you can actually store them on different types of storage. Uh, we're going to talk about Swift and Cinder in a moment. And of course, you can also store them on the native file system right in your Linux host itself. 
And if you're really cool and fancy and you want to keep them elsewhere just in case your local instances are, are not necessarily reliable or you want to share them out from different areas, you can also store them in AWS S3 or any other object storage where it has an API to be able to interact with it. Next, we have the Horizon dashboard, which is basically your GUI for OpenStack. It's where your users are going to go log in if they want to deploy kind of a self-service application. You can perform common administrative tasks in it, but if you're not a GUI person, that's okay too because you can do everything through the command line. Um, not all components are integrated into Horizon, but the things you'll need to get started with are. And as Horizon matures, it's beginning to add multi-language support. Now, the Swift system is an interesting one because it kind of stands alone by itself. It literally is its own project and it can be treated as a product. So object storage in the way that, that we treat it is the same as, you know, objects and CDNs out on the web. These are our traditional methods where we'll have you know, an internet facing service that has its own public facing switch as an example. Doesn't necessarily have to be this way. This could be in your own you know, on premises deployment as well. So Swift will actually authenticate you see who you are, what objects you've stored in there, or what you want to store, and decide what buckets you have access to. And then it's going to send you via a proxy, and that's going to bring you into the back end where we actually store all those neat nifty little objects. You can choose to span it out however large you want or however small you want, at a minimum of three nodes. Uh, you can actually do two nodes, and, yeah, but multiple storage uh, buckets within and using a ring topology it actually spreads that information and stores those objects elsewhere in small chunks. All of that chunk management and the replication is handled by Swift itself. It's actually a really cool project and there's a, you'll see there's a booth out called Swift Stack and that's actually what they do. They effectively take you know, fairly vanilla Swift but they package it nicely and give a good management front end for it and they help you to deploy that in your own platform or, or out in the cloud. The way that you use this is not in the way you use a normal file server where you can you know, modify in place. It's more that you would take a bunch of objects and you store them in there as a readable object. You can access them through HTTP or HTTPS. So when you've got your handy dandy user who say Jens wants to go in and he wants to access his documents, he would do so. If he wants to upload a document, then he would take that and he would push that through HTTP or HTTPS into the back end store. Same thing, I said read operation, it's all done over HTTP or HTTPS. Uh, the other thing you notice when we do a read, it doesn't actually remove the object. It's the same idea of general HTTP. You don't move it, you actually would you know, read it if you want and then if you wanted to, you could delete that movie in the middle there because we don't want that anymore. It's taking up unnecessary space. And then we have the other type of storage in OpenStack, Cinder or block storage, like a Cinder block. I always find that funny. Um, it's very similar to AWS's Elastic Block Storage. And in Cinder, you'll create a volume which you'll attach to an instance. An instance is just a virtual machine or a guest or whatever you're used to calling it in another world. And then the cool thing is that Cinder volumes will survive the termination of an instance. If you're coming from a virtualization background, you're really used to taking care of those virtual machines. Those virtual machines are super important. You have to plan about upgrading them and patching them and taking care of them. The cool thing is with OpenStack and Cinder, we don't care about those anymore. Our instances, they're just disposable. So if I have one version of OS and I need to upgrade it, I can just blow away my instance and then deploy a new one and cr connect my Cinder volumes back to it. It's a very different way of thinking for virtualization administrators, but it's another layer of abstraction. Now, one thing we're going to get into, we talk about networking, and there's two types of networking within OpenStack itself. There's the traditional legacy, you know, legacy but still continues to get development, is Nova Network. So Nova Network is part of the Nova project itself, the compute platform, which we'll talk about in a minute. And Nova Network has its own, you know, basic capabilities, which are actually fairly versatile, depending on what type of cloud you want to deploy. But for extended uh, networking features, uh, as well as being able to do overlay networks and such, you're going to want to run Neutron. Now, this one is a whole yak shaving exercise into itself to get rolling, and that's why it's important as we, you know, we have our, our couch to open stack type of build that we do. We're going to show you what the lab looks like. It's a good way to be able to test the waters on Neutron in a small environment, and then you can kind of, you know, see how it works best for your implementation. Now, who here uh, is a, say, a virtualization admin in their current role right now? Okay, who's a network admin in their current role? Oh, we got a few more. Okay, who's, 
Well, we've got a lot of non-hands, so I'm going to assume there's a lot of other, maybe development folks? Oh, okay, more. Ooh, I should have added a DevOps slide just to make everybody happy. Uh, so you think about networking isn't necessarily part of your day-to-day -to today. But as an OpenStack admin, it, it transcends where we came from in regular virtualization. We've got the ability to now be sort of tightly engaged with our, our network platforms at the physical layer or the logical layer. But it's done in an interesting way. They use what's called an ML2 or a modular layer 2 plugin. And that allows you to be able to be flexible in how they interact with OpenStack itself. Neutron has what's supported by traditional Nova networking, which is you know, local, flat, and uh, you know, small networks. Uh, you can also use VLAN in order to give some L2 boundaries in, or in your own OpenStack cloud. And then you can also use overlay networks, which include GRE and, and VXLAN. The good thing about this is that you can actually take your existing physical topology and extend it into your Neutron platform and all across your OpenStack cloud. It's an important piece as we think about how we use OpenStack versus how we did traditional virtualization or you know, standalone servers. You're not necessarily going to have the, the old school, you know, I know there's four servers in this rack, so there's four network addresses and it's all on one VLAN. It's, it's much more flexible and Neutron gives you that flexibility. So next we have our compute layer, or Nova. This is a platform that we're running our instances or our virtual machines, our guests on. We're gonna boot these from glance images. And the cool thing is we can pretty much support any hypervisor you want. So if you're running VMware today, that's great. You can support it there. But if you wanna look at KVM, you can do that too. And they can all live in harmony in the same OpenStack cloud. The only thing is you do need a different Nova controller for each type of hypervisor. And this is what's going to create and deploy your virtual machines for you. So of the, there's other uh, hypervisors that may be available. We kind of always pick on the top four. So who right now is running KVM as their hypervisor of choice? All right, I'll send a note to the Red Hat folks. They'll be happy with that. Uh, how about Zen? All right. Anyone using AWS? All right, you've got Zen. You don't realize it. Uh, vSphere. We saw a lot of VMware hands. All right, very cool. So this is neat because of the Hyper-V? Yeah, there Hyper -V? we go. Oh, sorry, I forgot about that I don't one. think one hand went up. Okay. All right. Oh, wait, one. Okay, great. Yay. It's not that bad. You can do it. Uh, so actually, we've got a lot of support. Microsoft has been very good about actually adding extended support for OpenStack because they, you know, like most other vendors, like VMware themselves, saw that it's important that they be a part of this ecosystem. Otherwise, that kind of line of business and their customers are going to going to move away from it just because they want that flexibility that is offered by OpenStack. So now we go back and we look at the eye chart again. We've got a, a simple concept of what each of these programs were. And then we look at the interaction. Now, of course, within each project, uh, the good thing is that you can see different components that are available. These are the individual projects. And then amongst it all this, there's one you hear every once in a while called Oslo. And this is kind of core features that are required in order to support your overall OpenStack cloud. This includes your database environment. So you notice that there's a little database bucket inside each of these. That's where it stores registry information and program information. And all of the interaction between every one of these projects is done by that handy dandy red dotted line. And we talk about APIs. APIs are very important. Now, who uses only APIs to communicate with their hypervisor today. Exactly. That's the beauty part. APIs are important to OpenStack, but they're not necessarily important to my desktop, the way that I interact. However, under the covers, of course, you're using APIs to communicate, whether it's over HTTP, through Horizon, whether you're going directly through the command line. Ultimately, that does use the API in order to interact. This is a loosely coupled environment. That's an important thing. Because in OpenStack, as we upgrade and move around features inside projects, they're all consistently available via the API. So that you know that not only the API has its availability, but it actually has a version. So as additional features come up, they'll add you know, V2 of the API. They'll keep V1 for a while, so you get continued flexibility. It's very gentle deprecation, which is a nice piece. They've actually added a dotted release of an API with Nova. It's actually 2.1. Uh, so there's... You always know by the API, by the URI, which one you're addressing. And that ensures that you can upgrade different programs without affecting the other ones in the environment. It gives you that flexibility versus if it was all done through straight code and they're all treated effectively as one big bucket of code, 
then you've got that really tightly coupled environment which has high risks. You know, we've gone through this, if you're a VMware admin, as new versions come up, they'll say, great, I can upgrade my, my hypervisor. Like, oh, not if you're running this other project or other product that doesn't necessarily work. And then we talk about the lab itself. Now, because we've only got 40 minutes, we can't go through all sorts of exciting things to spin it up. I could do the Martha Stewart pre-baked oven and show you how it works, but we'll actually do that easily in a couple of slides. If you want to run a good cookbook lab, which is what we're going to use, we can just use a couple of free, simple tools. Now, who's using Vagrant today? All right, that's what I like to see. Mitchell Hashimoto will be very happy to see that. Uh, and VirtualBox. VirtualBox, anyone using that as a, a local hyper? Excellent. All right, everybody's on the road. Who's got a GitHub account? Oh, wow. Oh, that's right, a lot of developers. This is cool. Now, we don't have to be a GitHub consumer as a, as a user, but you can actually you pull the code off of GitHub. It's freely available for the build of the lab itself. And of course, as you know, we've got flexibility because we can run this on Mac or on Windows or on Linux as a nested lab. And the important thing is the way we deployed the lab. Now you can use DevStack, and DevStack is very cool. I like it. I've used it. But I hit the wall at a very early point where it was like it's either an all-in-one node or the multi-node lab. It doesn't always build so well. And there's some challenges around different feature sets within it. The good thing about what we've done with the actual cookbook lab is that we see all the different projects that we have available to us. And again, you know, it's a, it's a multi-node lab, so we can see true node-to-node -node interaction. It has a controller, which will give you uh, the API services. It has your glance, your keystone, and your horizon baked in there. It has your database. We use, we use MariaDB in order to make sure that it's scalable. And we use RabbitMQ as the queuing service. Uh, Cupid is, uh, you'll often see that in different builds as well, but for the most part, RabbitMQ is kind of a common one. There's a Cinder storage node, and that's where we keep all of our neat images, and you can actually add volumes as needed. And there's two hypervisors. Each of them are running KVM. So those are both handled by the single controller because we're using one hypervisor. We only need one controller. And then we have the option to actually have Swift nodes. If you wanted to, to get really fancy and you want to run object storage, you can very easily spin up two Swift nodes, and it shows you how to you know, implement that ring architecture. And then the important thing, as I said, is Neutron. You know, outside of Nova Network, we want to get into the higher end capabilities, and this gives you the flexibility. So we have a Neutron node running, and we use OVS and OVS Bridge in order to communicate between the hypervisors. The good thing is that this is all done for you. It's as simple as git clone, vagrant up, go to the uh, web service in about 20 minutes, and, and life is good. It's a, it's a very simple way to do it, and we'll actually show, we'll give you the URLs for the code and, and everything as well as part of this. And then, you know, again, as you think about how you define your, your networks, in a, in a lab environment, this is kind of typical. This is what your regular lab would look like on a dev stack. It's going to be a very simple shared network. You know, one, one range of IP addresses, every tenant gets the same single endpoint. It's all connected to the outside world. And that's cool. It gets you what you need. But it's probably not effective for a real lab of what you're going to see in your production environment. So you can get into slightly more complex opportunities. You can use multiple flats. By multiple flat, that means that you have you know, separate networks, so you've got those separate L3 boundaries. But at the same time, you've got the ability to share between tenants. So that tenant C over to the middle right, you can see, is, can have access to both different networks. Uh, the more complex, and actually what's in the cookbook lab itself, is we have a shared external network, and then we have nested internal networks that are available to the tenants. This is a more common distribution. You're going to see where you want east-west traffic between the different nodes. You know, again, as you're getting started, a lot of this is going to be like, I don't even know what this means, and it doesn't necessarily matter. But as you get going, the good thing is that you'll see it in action. And there's actually a very nice browser inside the network section that shows you what the logical topology looks like as you deploy your nodes. It'll show you your instance and where it's connected to and where it's routed. So let's talk a little bit about online resources and where you can get some things to get started with. First, we have the OpenStack documentation. And it's going to sound a little silly, but RTFM totally applies here. The documentation is updated nightly, just like the code, and it's a really good resource. If you'll look, there's a bunch of different guides they publish. We have the install guides, the operation guides, the high availability guides, security, architecture and design. 
And then you can find all the OpenStack Cookbook information at OpenStackCookbook.com. Now, our advice would be to kind of anyone getting started, look for the guide that matches what you understand the most. So I'm more of an architecture and infrastructure type person. So I started with the architecture and design guide. And that was a good way for me to have everything make sense. It all related to things that I already understood and did on a daily basis. And the architecture guide is very good because it's, it's written by folks in our community. In fact, some of them might even be here today. Uh, if not in this room, they're definitely out on the floor somewhere. The good thing is that all of this content is created and contributed and maintained by all of us. You know, you don't necessarily have to do it yourself. That's, you can consume it as needed. Uh, the code and all of the, uh, the documents is updated nightly, just like the regular OpenStack code is. So these documentation you know, sets are actually all upgraded on the fly as people know. It's like, hey, I noticed on page 325 there was a, a missing period. You can put, uh, you put in a, a request to actually, you know, a Jarrett request. I'm, I want to get that fixed. The beauty part is that secures your ticket for the next OpenStack Summit. That's how cool it is that you can literally commit anything and get a $900 ticket. Now, how awesome is that? I literally committed a, you know, a capitalization error, and it shows technically as a commit. You know, it's, it's interesting that you can do that, and it's a good way for us to, to be able to contribute to the ecosystem if you choose to. And it's, again, it's not necessary, but it's a nice way. Maybe you're not a coder. I code only because I have to, but not really as, as for the love of the code but I do enjoy helping with documentation and training. So that's a good way for us to do it. Uh, and then of course, not only are they available by HTML, but you can actually download them as PDFs. So you can just actually just render it as a PDF. It's dated, so you know that you know which day you got it because someone will say, you know, I, your guide looks different than mine. Well, it's all right, it's, it's date stamped, so you get a sense of that. You can actually go back into previous releases if you want. Uh, we talked, you know, we had a great uh, keynote and we talked about, you know, what's going on with Comcast and with eBay and PayPal and all these big companies. So PayPal is doing something neat, but they're also doing something neat in, you know, Ice House. We're in Kilo, you know, came out a couple of weeks ago. Juno's available in between. So what you'll find is that you may have run into different iterations and you're going to get different versions and you can go back through those guides and, and get that information. So then you can wiki all the things. Every OpenStack program has its own wiki. So we just kind of went over some of the core things today, but let's say you're really interested in OpenStack Ironic, which is the program that deploys instances onto bare metal instead of using a hypervisor. There'll be a whole wiki on Ironic. It'll tell you the history, how it works, what changes have been in each release, and it's a really good way to start getting information on it. There's uh, development wikis for all the things that, you know, are kind of going on and constantly changing. And then one thing that's also happening this week is the Liberty Design Summit. So besides kind of celebrating Kilo and getting up to speed with that, we're going to be talking about what are the features that should be included with the Liberty release. So as that information becomes available and is decided on, you can look at the Launchpad links and the Etherpad for all the different notes from all the design sessions. So as developers, you know, we've got a big development community of the development folks in here. Who is actually developing in order to contribute just to OpenStack? All right, but who's a developer that wants to consume OpenStack and use it as their, their platform of choice? All right, a few more hands. Of course, again, this, this, is, this is the focus of, of the OpenStack Summit and the entire ecosystem. We want to provide services to the community, to the consumer of this service. You know, the reason why it's growing like it is is because we've got this need. You know, we've got developers that need flexibility, they need API accessible information, they need fast spin up and tear down, whether it's via command lines or APIs or their own personal SDK, it's, it's your choice. So when we look at, like I said, the OpenStack cookbook, you know, we definitely recommend that and that one's the, the build that we use and if you follow up what we do, we've got uh, our Twitters are usually alight with other people that are sharing good information. And if you want to have a cool, relaxed looking cloud like that guy over there, then, then that's a, a good place to go. Follow what we do and uh, you know, go to openstackcookbook.com. If you really want to get fancy, you can go over to room 106 and Cody Bunch, who's one of the authors, is actually helping out with the V brown bag. Uh, we actually did a Couch to OpenStack series with the V Brown Bag, which is an open, free, you know, training group that we work with. We just do online WebExes. That again is a is a great great place to start. If you actually search out Couch to OpenStack, you're going to find some of those videos. We're going to try and rerun the series again because it's. it's uh, I feel bad when I say it's training wheels for OpenStack, but that's really what it is. It's it's a getting started guide. It's 
you know, we're not saying that you can't figure it out, but why should you have to? Why should you have to go diving through pages and pages of reading when we can kind of walk you through it? And we've got a great community of folks that are happy to interact and answer questions for you. Again, you know, we're available on Twitter, uh, at Vemus33 and at DiscoPosti. We love to be able to help you through your journey in, in finding the best you can inside OpenStack. I know we've probably, hopefully, got some questions in here, and that's, we wanted to make sure that, you know, where people are and what, what's important to you and what you're learning with OpenStack. Oh, it's one of those midday sessions. Everyone wants to get to lunch, I know. It's all good. <laughs> so who has actually thought about taking formal training through, say, something like Marantz's Chronicle or the other options? Excellent. Okay. Now, the good thing as well, you know, when we talk about the different options inside OpenStack, there's a training area. If you just go to openstack.org forward slash training, uh, there's both free and, and commercial training opportunities there. Uh, if you wanted to contribute to training as well, if you find it's really cool and interesting and you want to feedback, you know, there's lots of meetups worldwide. You know, we can take a look at, at a few different things on the, you know, meetup.com or whatever their, their thing is, and, and you'll find other groups that are common folks with your hopes in your city, you know, or if you're not too far from where you are at least. You know, coming to the OpenStack, someone is one of the greatest groups, you know, because you know, this is why we enjoy it. We get to meet our peers. You, you see the code that's being written, and you get to see the people that are, that are up on stage telling you about it. You know, so again, while you're here to take in your journey, and you're probably overloaded, it's Thursday, everybody had a good night at uh, Cisco or HP the other night, we're, we're, we're happy with that, but everybody's a little a little tired. So, you know, take this in, consume it. All of these videos are available online. You know, we'll watch our Twitters, like I said, and, and our blogs, and we're actually going to share how we're going to help you to build that Couch to OpenStack program. And as we get into the, you know, further work that we're doing in that, you can kind of watch and feel free to interact and, and email us as needed. So any questions? Oh, all right. We have a question. Yeah, if you, if you don't mind going to the microphone, that'll be super. Thank you. I have experience with front-end development engineering, and I want to work on Horizon. Uh, I have little ex or no experience with OpenStack. What's the quickest way I can start working on the user interface, uh, and with without worrying with worrying as little as possible about the OpenStack install? What's the quickest path to just getting it running? That's uh, the OpenStack cookbook in in what we use is probably a, a fast path to get there because not only does it give you the ability to you know muck about with your instances itself and treating it as a lab, but you have access to a working code set right there. The good thing is you could just, if something goes horribly awry, you tear it down and you rebuild it in about 20 minutes. Uh, so you've got the full project access. Of course, if you go to uh, the GitHub for uh, Horizon itself, that's available there. But that's a good lab. Uh, you know, it's Python, Django. It's, it's very uh, common tools in order to modify it. Follow the Horizon developer wiki because that'll tell you uh, both through the, the wiki and through the launch pad. And you're going to find other folks that are out that are contributing actively into the ecosystem. And they're very, very happy to bring folks on board and, and help you to kind of do what you need to do to contribute back and, and make what you want out of the, the Horizon dashboard. Because not only are you going to you know, get value maybe in what your organization wants to do, but we'd love to see that that code come back upstream, it's, it's kind of a fun feeling, and, and it's good for everybody when we get enhancements that way. So. And another good point of the OpenStack cookbook, besides the fact you can just go download the code and get it running, the actual cookbook itself will tell you exactly what's in that code and exactly what you need to do if you want to just open up that book and go step by step and do it yourself. Yeah, so it's, if you want the full Martha Stewart pre-baked oven, you, you can do that in one instance. If you want to spin up the lab, you can literally walk through step by step. It's very, very cool. Any other questions? Oh, y'all are a quiet and hungry bunch. Okay. Well, we're going to release you a couple minutes early because we, we definitely we value everyone's time. We want to thank everyone for coming today. Yes, this, thank you uh, very much for coming. Feel free to tweet us if you have any questions or want any more information about anything we talked about today. Thank you.